What is at the heart of real Christianity? Where can we find it? If it is to be a life lived, on what foundation must our faithful living be built? Perhaps it is more simple than we think, yet at the same time involving a more radical change than we may have previously realized. We have heard what many others have said, but what exactly did he say? Are there instructions to be found for something as simple as how we should pray? Christ followers are called to love the unlovable, choose peace over panic. We are called to focus on truth and trust. And yet we ask, what is at the heart of real Christianity? Those who have ears, let them hear, Jesus said. And so, in humility, we lean in. In hope, we listen. In faith, we ask. Jesus, would you teach us once again? Good evening, everybody. There we go. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Julian Hobdy. I'm the lead pastor for this service. Uh, it's always a delight to be in worship with you. Uh, it was good when they said to me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Um, let me invite you now to open your Bibles. Turn with me now to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. We will continue our time together. Now, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there is one that is available to you in the backs of the pews uh, right now. But if you would like one at home for your own personal study, we would love for you to have one as well. And we would love to be the church that provides that for you. And that's true for you who are online as well. So you can send me an email to Pastor Julian at fmcm.org. Uh, and I would love uh, to be responsible for getting a Bible into your hands. All right, now I want you to mark Matthew 6. We're going to come back to the reading of that. I just want to make sure you have that marked for yourself so you're able to follow along when we get to the reading. Uh, now let's have just a brief word of prayer before we begin. Gracious Lord, fill this place. Fill our hearts and our minds. Uh, remove everything that keeps us from you and speak to us through this message. That we all would be changed. We would all learn. We would all grow. We would all be transformed by this encounter with you. And we would not be limited by the things that would keep us from you. So we give you glory and thanks now for what you are already going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we are continuing our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've come to another shift in the text. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time in the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, and Jesus begins that chapter describing the kingdom life. He tells us what the kingdom life looks like, what it looks like to be uh, living a life in relationship with God. Right around verse 17 takes a slight turn and he moves from the description of the kingdom life and then gives us the implications of the kingdom life on our various relationships. Uh, in the first third of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he shows us what kingdom life looks like on the outside and reminds us that we don't just embrace the benefits package of the kingdom. Uh, we also got to do the work. When I was growing up, one of the things my mom used to say, she doesn't remember this, but I do, is that when you're part of a family, you don't just eat at the table, you also got to wash dishes. And Jesus invites us to be a part of the dishwashing work for the kingdom. And that when we embrace the kingdom life, we embrace the kingdom work. And Jesus' work is always related to healing and restoring, which means in our relationships, we are called to restoration rather than reciprocity. Some of y'all are going to get that on the way home, but that was good when I wrote it. I felt good about it. Hopefully you feel good too. We are not called to, uh, we are called to restoration and not reciprocity. And then chapter 6, amen, there we go. 
And then chapter 6 marks an, an additional shift. He moves us from description of the kingdom life and the implications of the kingdom life on our various relationships. And now he is moving from the external actions to the internal motivations. Jesus confronts us and confronts the quintessential temptation that we face. Namely, in our previous life, our life was all about us. Uh, before our relationship with God, even the good that we did was done without the love of God in our hearts. And in that, it was a broken goodness. It was a goodness that wasn't quite good enough. And he tells us, he, he, he reminds us that our actions tells others uh, something about who we are, or at least what we want them to think about who we are. But how and why we do our actions tells us the truth about where our hearts truly lie. In other words, as far as Christ is concerned, the why and the how matters more than the what. And it's in that spirit that Jesus moves us into an area of conversation that most of us don't like to talk about. That's Jesus just complicating the issue, making things harder, because that's just what Jesus be doing. And he takes us now to the text for our reading today. I'm going to read a portion of the scripture, and then we'll come to the rest of it. And the beginning of the scripture reads this way in verse 19 of chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, what is Jesus saying here? That's the question. Now, we can spiritualize this and we can do all kind of linguistic gymnastics and play around with the text and see what he's trying to say and what he might be in this very esoteric way saying what the treasures might be. But he's already in the previous chapter dealt with very tangible realities that are tangential to human life. He deals with anger and lust and marriage and divorce. He, he deals with what really goes on with people. And so I think it is safe to say, safe to assume uh, that what Jesus is talking about in this text is also something tangible. He's talking about money, goods, uh, things that we have come to value. And he's challenging us and reminding us of a couple of things that are a part of the temptations we have already experienced. There's something to be said in this conversation around money why the appearance of wealth is referred to as the trappings of success or the trappings of wealth. And Christ comes to deal with us, to talk to us about the potential dangers of affluence. Now, uh, I... It's always interesting having conversations in the pulpit to you about things, especially related to money, because I see you looking at me, looking at you, and, and y'all looking at me like, hey, come on, keep on moving, but we're going to deal with it today. Now, to do that, though, let me say a few things quickly about what the text is not saying. Let's alleviate some of the pressure. This is not a prohibition against having the things that are related to having wealth. In other words, this is not a prohibition against things like having private, private property. The early church uh, was, most of that was experienced through home churches. Uh, a good chunk of Jesus' ministry happened in people's homes. And so this isn't a prohibition against having private property. This also isn't a prohibition against having a savings of putting some money aside. In Psalm or Proverbs 6, uh, the text tells us to, to look to the wisdom of the ant. The ant doesn't have an overseer. He doesn't have a supervisor. He doesn't have a commander and yet has the sense to store up things in the winter 
uh, to store up things uh, in the summer and gathers them uh, for food at the harvest. And so uh, and the, the, in Timothy, we're told, 1 Timothy, we are told that if a person doesn't provide for their family, that they have betrayed the faith and they are worse than an unbeliever. So this isn't a prohibition against saving and putting money aside. This also isn't a prohibition against just enjoying the things that you own. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of it belongs to God, and I believe strongly that God has given us this world to enjoy it. So this isn't like if you if you got a PS5, play your PS5, do what you do. Like if you whatever whatever your source of entertainment is, my wife and I like Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max, and we enjoy it. So I encourage you, enjoy the things that you do have. It's not a prohibition against that. There's something far more important and substantial that Jesus is dealing with. Possessions are not the problem. Being possessed by your possessions is. The prohibition is against luxury for the sake of luxury. The selfish storage of resources and our inability to release them for the sake of the kingdom. Remember, Jesus' message, his mission, all of it is always connected to healing what is broken in the world. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we follow Christ into Christ's own mission. That means we are connected to a mission of healing what is broken and what is needs repair in the world. And when we become so consumed with our luxury that it makes us numb to the needs of the world, when it makes us numb to uh, suffering and poverty in the world, when it, when it makes us incapable of being connected or understanding ourselves to be connected to suffering and injustice that happens in the world, something has gone terribly wrong. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King shared these words, that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And he says this immediately after having said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What he meant was that we are inextricably insolubly and irrevocably tied to one another. We belong to each other and loving God means loving what God loves. Jesus is always concerned with the broken and the brokenhearted. Jesus is always concerned with what is broken in the world. In fact, Jesus' own existence in a physical body is proof of God's ultimate concern with what has gone wrong and what has been broken in his creation. And Jesus comes to heal our deepest sickness and his mission is always about reconciliation, restoration, and resurrection. And King, when when Dr. King shared those words in the letter from a Birmingham jail, King was on to something. In fact, uh, it was the Sermon on the Mount that gave the original inspiration for the origins of the civil rights movement. And King heard Jesus clearly as we need to hear clearly. And what King realized, what Jesus was saying, what it means to be fully human is to be inherently connected to others. There is an inherent interconnectivity and interdependence that is part of the rhythm of creation. After all, from eternity past, God exists in community as a triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before there were plants and animals, before there were sky and oceans, before there was sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, God existed in community, which means as persons in made in God's image, as people who reflect God's essence, community is a part of who we are. All of that I'm saying to say when our focus 
is on, in our life, is only on our life and understands your life as disconnected from other lives, it is not only something gone wrong, but according to the rhythm of creation, it robs you of your very humanity. The text is building a case. It's building on top of itself. Last week, we had a focus on fasting, and uh, we, uh, where we were challenged to bring our appetites under subjection. Uh, Pastor David told us that the kingdom life is a life of self-denial that leads to self-awareness that produces self-control. And if I were to push that further, as I do tend to push things further, then I would say that you can tell where your greatest affection lies by looking at what you aren't willing to give up especially what you aren't willing to give up for the sake of others. Christ calls us to practices like fasting. And if we can't or won't perhaps uh, uh, fast, then our hunger may be our greatest affection. God called Adam to abstain from one tree, and Adam couldn't because his desire for his own autonomy was greater than his appreciation of God's authority. In other words, what you withhold from withholding is probably the thing you desire most. If the math didn't math on that, let me say that one more time. If what you withhold from withholding is probably the thing you desire most. Let me say it another way. What you can't give up is probably the thing that you love the most. What you desire the most, you devote your life to. And what you devote your life to is the object of your worship. And if what you are devoted to pulls you away from Christ's mission of healing and restoring and recovering and resurrecting in the world, then it actively works against you. Jesus warns us. He warns us about the dangers surrounding the objects of our greatest desire, our treasure, as he calls it. In verse 21 the text reads, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now that language of, um, of the heart just means that the, the, the total core of one's own being. So whatever you have made your treasure, the heart is going to follow that. It follows then that the question we must ask ourselves is what have we made our treasure? And Jesus seems to be suggesting to us one way to see where your heart is is by looking at how you use your resources. You've heard the expression, uh, put your money where your mouth is. You might think of that through Jesus' lens as your money tells us where your heart is. That was good. I felt the amen in my own soul. That was good. You've, this isn't a statement about quantity. We all, we, we, we all know, we all know this, that what you believe in, you give to. And uh, you give what you have valued to that that you have deemed to be valuable. So again, this isn't a statement. This idea is an, a, is an idea about um, quantity, about how much you give. It's about giving attention to your intentions. When we come to Christ, we give our lives over to Christ. That means we give over all of our life to Christ. It's not just our hope for eternity. It's our here and now. We abandon our old life to embrace a new life with God, a kingdom life. And embracing kingdom life means embracing the kingdom mission, the mission to heal, to liberate, to proclaim, and to enlarge the territory of the kingdom in the earth. And when we look at where we are investing our life, we must ask ourselves, is this the kingdom of God? 
Are your finances only a resource for your pleasure and convenience or is it a tool for building up the kingdom? In other words, where are your fiduciary responsibilities focused? Where is your focus? Where are you focused? Where is your life? Where is your mind? Where is your heart focused? Is it on doing the will of God or is it on having God help you to do your own will? Jesus says to us, Uh, In in the last section of this text that we've been reading, the eye, the focus, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, the text tells us that we've got to guard our focus. You got to guard your focus. Um, thinking about this, it reminded me uh, uh, of a story when I was in high school. When I was 15, much like many of the students my own age at that time, uh, I, I was enrolled in driving school. And I was in driving school because my mom had no patience to be in the car with us when we learned how to drive. And so my mom was like, nah, you got to go. You got to go up there and let them people deal with that because I can't do that. And over time, I feel like my mom probably had the right idea. I don't, I don't know if I had the patience to be in the car with my mom as I was learning how to drive myself. So I was in driving school, and, you know, in driving school, you got two parts. You got the theoretical side. You got, the, like, the time in class where you, you read the books and you read about driving and you learn all the rules and all the other stuff. No, and everybody got to do that part. Everybody only cares about the one part. That's getting behind the wheel. That's what everybody who goes to driving school wants to do. And that was my favorite part. I couldn't wait to get behind the wheel. I got a chance to practice a little bit with my older brother in the elementary school parking lot by our house. And by the time I got to driving school, I was doing figure eights in reverse in the car. And I was like, let's do this. Let's just give me this license. I'm ready. Now, now in driving school, um, you, you, you have to ride with other people too, right? It's not just you and an instructor. It's an instructor, you, and like two other people. However many people can fit in the car. If you can get a clown car's worth of people in that car, it's going to be all y'all taking turns driving. So I'm in driving school. We finally get behind the wheel. Uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, and we get in the car. And over and over again, the instructors say to us the same words. Keep your eyes on the road. And that felt painfully obvious, but they said it a lot. Keep your eyes on the road. And we got in the car and, you know, we couldn't turn on any music. We couldn't have any kinds of distractions. It was just the same refrain. Keep your eyes on the road. Even when we checked the mirror or were getting ready to switch lanes, the the instructor would, like, glance for a second and then keep your eyes on the road. Now, one of those times got real interesting real fast. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm riding, I'm in the clown car with one of the other students, and they're, they're driving, it's their turn. I'm sitting in the back seat, super uncomfortable, because I didn't want to be there, because they were already had issues before. They braked wrong, they switched lanes wrong. It just felt terrible riding with them. But I'm in the back seat, and I'm riding, I'm taking my turn, and there's a point where the instructor begins to give this student some, some notes on their driving. He starts to, starts to give them some, some, some thoughts about what they've been doing. And instinctively, this child uh, turned. Like, so, you know, you're sitting in the driver's seat. You're in the left seat. The, the instructor's in the right seat. They got the little foot brake so they can stop <laughs> without you. Uh, and the instructor's over there, and he's talking to them. And then this kid... While he's driving, turns his head to look at the instructor. Whoa, 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 brother. Whoa, what we doing? What we doing? What we doing? What we doing? And this kid, he turns and he looks. And all of a sudden, you feel the tension in the car begin to mount because we are drifting. We are moving into the shoulder lane. And the instructor uses that handy teacher brake, brakes for us, and reminds him what he had already said. Keep your eyes on the road. And I learned something that day, that when where our focus is fixed, we will drift. 
The eyes lead the body, and where we focus, we follow. And when our eye is set in a certain direction, we move into that direction. And here's the thing about the drift. You don't even know that you're drifting until chaos happens around you. Uh, some of y'all have been in the car, and you've seen this, people on the road that are more, more focused on their phone than they are their eyes on the road. I just looked up, and some of y'all looked away, so maybe y'all are the people that be focusing on your phone that brings chaos around you. But the drift happens un- unbeknownst to you. The drift is taking place because you have already focused and where your eyes go, so does your body. Your body tends to follow where you've gone. In other words, you've got to guard your focus. You've got to keep your eyes on the road. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. See, the problem that Jesus is referencing for us, the problem isn't money or wealth. The problem is our focus. The problem is our focus on the money or the wealth. And when you focus on your resources as the source of your well-being, and when your focus is focused firmly on you, uh, you've misappropriated the tool that, and made it uh, a means of establishing your own identity. You've taken your eye off the road and you've begun to drift. And Jesus warns us about this, that we, the problem is, is that we get caught up at times because we can be tempted to think that money is the thing that is going to make us happy. If I just had this dollar amount, if I, if I just won the lotto, my mom used to say all the time, if, I, if Publishers Clearinghouse would just show up at my door. If we just had, I wouldn't, I don't even want wealth and fame, Lord. I just want this amount of money. If I get this, everything will be cool. And the problem is, is that we think that the tool is the thing that's going to make us happy. And we look to these resources to, to give us happiness. And a wealth of resources, to be sure, it can get you a lot of your want, but it cannot satisfy your deepest needs. You got to guard your focus. See, money can't buy you the things that you need. Money can't buy you joy. There's a, plenty of people that got a lot of money and they don't have joy. And this joy that I'm talking about is what Nehemiah described as the joy of the Lord. And he said that this joy, the joy of the Lord, is the joy that gives you strength. It's joy is, uh, this kind of joy is what you, what you have and it can hold you up when life seems to knock you down. Joy is what makes you strong when all you got left is weakness. Joy makes you know when life tears you down, drags you out, chews you up, and then spits you out that that thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me, thy glory, the lifter of my head. Money can't buy you joy. Not only can money not buy you joy, but money can't buy you peace. It can't buy you hope. Money can't give you uh, this hope that gives us the ability to endure in life. When I was growing up, uh, the, the, the preachers in my, in my hometown, they used to have an acronym for hope. They said that it was holding on, praying, expecting. And this hope is substantiated by faith, and faith is only as strong as its object. So if your faith is in you alone, if your faith is in your resources alone, uh, then you are going to find yourself at a certain point uh, devastated and disappointed. If your faith is in your 401k, you might find yourself stressed and de-stressed at a different point in time and depressed. If your faith is in your investments or in your job or in your career, you might find yourself despondent. But when your hope and faith is in Jesus and Jesus crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected, you've got good reason to hold on praying, expecting. Why? Because you can testify that my hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Why? Because on Christ, the solid rock, I'll stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Every other ground is sinking sand. Money can't buy you hope. And money can't buy you peace. 
But when our focus is on Christ, when our delight is to do the will of God, and when we allow the word of God to speak into our lives and have authority over our decision making, then we get a peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that just don't make no sense. I know that's not good grammar, but I got to say it the way I know it. A peace that don't make no sense. A peace that is calm in the middle of a raging storm. A peace that comes when, 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 when the disciples are on a boat and they're wondering how are we going to get to the other side. And Jesus is the only one not worried. Sleep gets up and says, peace, be still. This peace that can endure storm and struggle. A peace that is unshakable when the suffering seems unmovable. A joy that is stronger than any tragedy that finds its way into our lives. And a hope that can endure when all hope seems Lost, and all of it is a product of having, been ma- having made Christ our joy, our very treasure, the focus of our lives. Money, resources, wealth, these are not the problem. The temptation we face with them is to be self-reliant and independent, but your life was never meant to be lived that way. In fact, when God created the entire cosmos, the sun, the moon, the stars, the birds of the air, the flowers of the field, the lilies of the valley, and the things that creep and crawl and swim in the underbelly of the earth. When God made all of that, the only thing that he said was not good was when man was by himself. You were never meant to do this on your own. You were never, you were not conditioned for self-reliance. That's not your makeup. And when our focus is misaligned and we drive it into ourselves, we can make money and resources the source of our happiness. But when Christ is our treasure, when the work and will of God's kingdom is our focus, a blessedness flows into and from our lives that our resources never could. So guard your focus. Make Christ the central focal point in your life and avoid driving into self-focus and embrace kingdom living. And this life you live will be marked by more joy, hope, and peace than you could ever find on your own. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord. You must be our focus. When we make other things our focus, God, we lose sight and we drift. We find ourselves drifting to things that cannot satisfy. We find ourselves drifting to things that take away from us. We find ourselves drifting to things that take us away from you. When that happens, God, we are just dead people walking. But help us, God, help us to guard our focus. Help us to fix our eyes on you so that in everything that we do, in our giving and our receiving, in our going and our coming, in our resting and our labor, in all of it, you being our focus gives us what we need to do it well. And by a life lived well, With a focus fixed on you, we can live live changed lives that change other lives. So God, be our focus, and we will give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.